Hey guys, Matteo here. Welcome back to a new video. And today is going to be a QA. and a A couple of days ago, I asked you uh, about your question on the community tab on YouTube. And I got pretty much 30 different questions that I'm going to answer today. And hopefully it's going to be a way for you to just disconnect from all this madness, news and stuff like that. So let's go back and talk about uh, cinematography, filmmaking, cameras, lenses, whatever you guys ask me right here. So the very first question that I get asked was, uh, how do you expose low light and nine time shot? MIG vision, Miguel, hi Miguel. Pretty much the same concept that I use for any other shot, uh, even like daylights and stuff like that. So what I usually do, I just uh, make sure that my level are good on the skin tones if I have a subject. It's not like a, a particular technique or anything. I pretty much use the full scholar all the time and I pick up an ISO that is not gonna give me a crazy amount of noise. Uh, in the case for like low light, I'm thinking about sunset shot or sunrise shot. I usually tend to silhouetting my subject because I really like it. So I drop, I, I close my aperture like all the way to, I don't know, F8 or F11. Doing that gives me an incredible amount of colors and contrast in the sky that is usually really hard to get if you expose for both shadows and highlights. Nighttime, I just shot at my friend wedding. The venue was really, really dark and I had lots and lots of noise with the Pocket 6K at 3200 ISO. If a scene is dark and you don't have light, you're gonna have noise, doesn't matter how clean your camera and the sensor is. So nothing really you can do about it. We can't expect to go out there completely pitch black and, and be able to see in the darkness with this camera. Um, it's great in low light, but we need some light, especially if we have a subject, we need to light that subject. That's pretty much what I do. I just follow my full scholars chart and I be sure that I'm not overexposing anything. So usually with the pocket 6K or the 4K, I keep my ISO at 1250 in low light and max 3200 and I go in between that. If you have some, you know, like candles or stuff like that and you're shooting at 1250, it's likely that those eyelids are gonna be clipped and blown because the contrast level at 1250 is pretty insane. Next question, Jules, Frederick, Nerissant. How do you transport your camera setup when you travel short and long distance? I have a pretty compact setup to be honest. So I basically have two small Pelican cases. One is for my Leica and some batteries and my top handle. And the other one is for the matte box, the batteries, the ND filters, the plate, the battery plate, and all that kind of stuff. And then I have my backpack where I put my camera, some accessories, second monitor, and other stuff. But it's basically just two small Pelican cases and the backpack. And of course, if I need a tripod, I have my tripod in this case with the slider. If I travel with plane, by myself, I have to play around with batteries because I can't check them. So what I usually do, I check the Pelican that has the matte box and the follow focus and the Nisi ND, but I take out the V-mount batteries and I only leave the battery charger in there and I put my V-mount in the backpack. So I need to, you know, play around with stuff and be creative when you, when you travel with plane. It's pretty compact and I can uh, pretty much fit everything uh, in those two Pelican cases. I also have like a really big, Pelican case where I sometimes put my tripod slider, a couple of light stand and a couple of lights, like flex lights. But also keep in mind that I have a case exclusively for the Leica R. So if in this case I'm shooting with the 18 to 35, if I had to take only my 18 to 35, I would definitely not need a second Pelican case. So basically I can fit everything within my backpack and one small Pelican case, which is great. Next question, Curtis Ratliff. Uh, how do you manage to capture such amazing shot with backlit sunsets? Uh, every time I try the image is either washed out or my subject is nothing but a silhouette. As I mentioned before, that's pretty much all I do with sunset shot. I'm a really big fan of silhouetting stuff. So if you notice my shot, you have an extreme eye contrast uh, within the sky and, and the subject, which is silhouetted. And that's because again, I close down my aperture because I want to capture those details in the sky and I don't care if the subject is in silhouette because uh, at that point I'm looking for that. Of course, if I need to see the subject, 
at that point you have to be creative you have to open up a little bit get more information in the shadows or maybe even bouncing some lights in terms of like interview when i usually have backlit subject you know for me is the only way to get good images in in direct sunlight without any diffuser and stuff what i usually do yeah i put my subject against the sun and then i shoot right into it, it it's it's tricky but if you're shooting on a vintage lens you might want to use a french flag so the image doesn't get washed out but on the other side when i use the leica i can do whatever i want because those lenses don't really flare that much and they don't wash out the image so sunset i usually silhouette the subject and for interview in bright daylight condition i always backlit and maybe bounce some light once in a while but um Usually I don't, the dynamic range of the pocket I think is great, so uh, no problems there. Next question, Michael Rayshard, pertaining the Leica Summicron lenses specifically, why are some price, why are some price higher uh, than other across Amazon and eBay? Is there a difference in image quality? Technically, there is a difference, and that's the reason why I bought my Leicas that are serial 30, 31. Basically, when they're like 26, 27, 28 they're uh, very old so the image is you know that lens has a lot of imperfection when you start getting to the 35 36 range they're way more expensive because they're newer but apparently the look is not as vintage and as Leica as the previous serial number so you want to find the sweet spot in the middle in my case I think I'm in the right spot so mine are 30 to 31 I think they're the best in terms of preserving the vintage like a look and and not having all those imperfections but what you're basically seeing online is that a higher serial number um, are newer lenses so they cost more and older serial number this older lenses so they cost a little bit less also a big difference is made by the condition of the lens for sure and also if it's a cinemod and by who so mine are duclos cinemod they're perfect condition Serial number 30 and 31, they're all color match. So that's a very important thing. Cause if you shop online like Amazon or eBay and you have like a 27 serial number and a 30 and a 36 and a 35, and you try to put them together, it's gonna be very hard having like a, a good color match. So Kiri Klaikov asks me um, how to properly choose ISO on Blackmagic Pocket. Still don't quite understand how it works in connection with dynamic range. According to Blackmagic chart, I should choose higher ISO for better highlights. Is it correct? In theory, yes. In practice, when you shoot 1000 ISO on the pocket 4K or 6K, the image is gonna have some pretty nasty noise. So I never ever shot 1000 ISO and I will never do that. Even 800 is really bad. Even in bright daylight condition, I did my test and I uh, checked the image on my computer. And when you're filming in the sun, the, sh the, the part where you have some shadows, they're full of noise and it's bad noise. You have a very weird contrast. So the image is not as contrasty. It's like the kind of like the shadows get lift up a lot. And it also changed kind of like the colors too. So it gets a little bit more magenta than what the other ISO have. On the same level, 1250 ISO is extremely clean, but the, the contrast is it's insane. So it clips the highlights like crazy. So it's good for low light, but I would never shoot 1250 in bright daylight at all. So to answer your question, yeah, technically at 1000 ISO, you have a better dynamic range, especially in the, in the highlights. But what I usually do, I always shoot for under ISO outside and I push it max to 640 and uh, that's pretty much it. I never really go higher than that. And I mean, I, I, I know the chart, Blackmagic chart says that, but I did my test and I, and I to be completely honest, I, I'm not sure there's a huge difference at 1,400 in the highlights for Olaf. Yeah, it's a bit smoother, sure, but I mean, uh, is it that crazy of a difference? Not really. And is it worth it to get that extra noise? Not for me. So what I suggest to pocket user, as I mentioned in my full color video, I will stick to 400, max 640 during the day. And at night, you can go from 1250 to 3200. That's pretty decent. 
Next question, DJ Parrots. Uh, um, how can I get involved in iPaint projects? How did you get the gig with Mercedes? So second question, the Mercedes thing was uh, through a connection that I had with my friend, uh, production company in Italy. So they had this gig and they um, reached out to me and they asked me if I wanted to DP and I said yes. How can I get involved in I paying project? Dude, I don't know, it's, it's just so random and uh, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I think we, ev what everybody should do, what I'm doing as a cinematographer, I'm trying to push myself all the time. I try to do uh, short film that I think they're, they have a good story. Uh, feature film, even if extremely low budget, I try to do that, um, but it's really hard to find a good one. And spec cat, I mean, if we start shooting spec cat on spec cat on spec cat, and we try to make something that looks like uh, like one of those top high end commercial, there's chances that um, agencies around the world they might see that and maybe reach out to you. But it's so random and it's 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 complicated. Okay, next question, uh, the mystic artist SSD that can handle the higher quality possible in the Pocket 4K. I probably never shot the higher the highest quality possible even on the 6k i maybe shoot five by one uh because i don't need more than that my samsung t5 have been working great and uh, i don't know if they can record 6k 60p q0 or three by one i don't know that but i'm 100 percent sure they can record 6k 24p three by one because I try that. Joe Music, hey Mattel, is it a good idea to buy a used Pocket 4K to use with my original Blackmagic? Yeah, I think so. There is a video on my channel that I put side by side my Pocket 4K and the, po the original Pocket. Basically what you have to do in order to perfectly match those two camera is you have to shoot raw on the original Pocket. If you shoot raw on the original Pocket, once you bring the files in DaVinci, under the raw tab, when you're in the color grading tab, you can switch color science to V4, only if you shoot raw. Once you switch color science to V4, the footage is gonna be pretty much identical to the Pocket 4K. Next question, Diego Noriega Production, have you ever wanted to get into more narrative work? Have you considered ever joining the Cinematographer Union, Local 600? Diego, that's... My ultimate goal is making movie, making feature films. I shot one for now, the non crawl one that I've been waiting to, to watch. I have a couple of proposals. There is a really interesting one, but everything is now stopped, shut down. So I'm really hoping I'm gonna be able to shoot a, another feature film soon, because that's what I wanna do. But it's extremely hard to find good scripts. In terms of union, so it's not, let's, let's clarify something for everybody, if, if you're wondering. It's not that you join the union and then you, you're gonna start working like crazy on Apple commercial and Verizon commercial. It, it doesn't work like that. Being union allows you, if you have the connection and to get those jobs, it's gonna allow you to work for those jobs. It's gonna give you some benefits as well, but in LA, if you wanna join the local 600 as a cinematographer, you have to drop $15,000, $15,000. Again, if they will tell me, hey, drop 15K, and then you're gonna start doing Apple commercial, I'll do it right away. But this is not the case. So is it worth it? Yeah, maybe if you have some geeks, big geeks, plan out at their union, sure, why not? But Otherwise, is it worth it to invest $15,000? For me right now, absolutely not. And the next question, Robbie Ibor. How are you and your business coping with the COVID-19 situation? Any tips as a freelance filmmaker? It's, it's pretty bad. I'm pretty scared about the uh, financial and economic consequences of this thing, especially for a freelancer and people in the film industry in particular, they postpone or cancel every single shoot that I had planned out. The, the one that I have at the end of April is still there, but who knows for how long. My company is doing okay. That means we're just waiting. Everybody, I, I'm not aware of anybody working right now because uh, technically 
is illegal in most of the states because if you're not a non-essential business, I'm not even sure you could work technically. Any tips for freelance filmmaker, man? It, it, it's been extremely hard for me and uh, I have a lot of stuff to do. I could do way more, but I wake up in the morning, I turn on the news for some reason, I shouldn't, and I get so depressed that most of the time I kind of get stuck on the couch, maybe I go out, I walk for a bit, looking for inspiration, nothing. Today, same thing. The only thing I can think of is what I can cook at night. So I, I went out today and I bought a couple of filet mignon and, and I thought about what wine should I open to pair with the meat. These are honestly my thoughts right now. I, I don't have the, even doing this video is extremely hard. I couldn't, I, I mean, I didn't want to do it, but I, I forced myself to do it because I'm like, I need to push out some content and do something and trying to find motivation. I have an entire wine documentary that I have to edit. And even there, it's been extremely hard. And the reason why this is hard, I think, is one. If they tell us, hey, Matteo, for the next two months, you're gonna be locked down in your house. You can't do anything. But in two months, everything is gonna be back to normal. And literally after 60 days, on the 61th day, you can get out of your place, go to the airport and fly back to Italy to your family. If they would have told me that, my mind would be in a completely different position. I would be like, okay, I have two months to do this, this, this and that, because then everything is gonna be back to normal after those two months and everybody's gonna be so busy. So I have two months. But the problem here is that we don't know how long this is gonna last. Someone say two weeks, someone say three weeks, my family in Italy is almost one month since it's locked down. It's a situation that is crazy because we don't know when it's going to end. And I think, I don't think I'm, it's just me. I think everybody is in the situation where they can't think of something that doesn't have an end. Any tips as a freelance filmmaker? I think it's a good chance to um, use... If you have a business, especially, and you can prove this to the authorities, um, you could go out and shoot some stock footage, maybe trying to sell into magazine online. Field supply, uh, I know stock footage are in high demand right now because nobody can shoot, but there's company out there that still need commercial work and, and, and spot and everything. So I think stock footage could be a really good thing. If you're a one-man band, you probably have a big advantage compared to people that work only with crew, because uh, we could do everything. So I can go out there with a the camera and the microphone and record an interview, staying six feet away and uh, shoot some B-roll with no people in there and go back home and edit the video. I don't think though the company and the business are in the mind, in the mentality now to spend money with video. This, this situation is definitely gonna unlock at some point and we need to, even if we stuck in this situation for a month, our brain at some point is going to process the thing. It's going to be like, okay, this is what's going on. This is the situation. How, what can we do? How can we invest our money? How can we make money? But as of for right now, there's like a big financial and economic question mark where it's like, what is happening to all these small businesses and businesses and people that they're getting laid off? It's just crazy. So nobody knows. But to me, stock footage for sure. YouTube for sure. Um, even if I know traffic is going down for a lot of people because probably people are just focusing on, on the coronavirus and uh, they don't care about the new camera, the new MacBook, the new stuff that's coming out. Nobody cares. In my opinion, stock footage should be a huge, huge thing for people right now. And it could also be a great excuse to get out of your place. So how do you go about planning your documentaries? The documentaries you shoot, is there a lot of pre-production that goes into it? Not really. Uh, I said it before too, um, not a lot of pre-production at all. For documentary, I basically write down some questions that I think they're interested for the subject that I'm interviewing. And then from, I'm gonna use those answer to build up the narrative. But for documentaries, I don't think you need a lot of uh, pre-production. Next question, Henry Dioval Candelario. As a cinematographer, how do you compose a cinematic scene or frame? I just check my monitor and I, and I frame stuff as I they're cool um, I don't know how I do it that's a very tricky question 
how do you compose? Well, I have the, um, how you call them? The third, the grid, but I just keep those in mind and I use them as a reference, but it's mainly just a situation thing, you know? I just grab my camera and I point it, and that's why I keep saying that I can't really uh, do a crazy amount of work in pre-production because until I have my camera in my hand and I check the frame and I see the monitor, and I see the subject and the light and everything at the moment, uh, it's really hard for me to uh, understand what's going on. So I'm a, one of those guys that needs to see through the viewfinder, through the monitor and and check things at the moment. It's not that, I know there's people that built up 3D model. Oh, the subject's gonna walk this way. We're gonna walk this way with the camera. And then how can, how do you, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know. I, I, I'm a very, I, I'm a big, big fan of like uh, improvising. Next question, Zia. I think we all wonder how do you expose and white balance? Maybe some tips for full scholar would be huge. If you go into my, uh, to my channel, there is a video about full scholars that is, I think, very uh, informative, or at least that's what a lot of people think. So I really recommend to check that for full scholar. And for white balance, I have to be completely honest with you. I should be raw all the times right now. So I set it up to anywhere between 5,000 and 6,000. White balance, when you shoot raw, is only metadata. So I don't really care. As long as it looks okay in the monitor, I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm not... Um, I usually, when I'm outside, I set it up to 58, 6,000. And when I'm inside, I just move it maybe 5,000, 4,000, sometimes 3,000. But, and again, I, if I have to change it, I change it in post because it's raw. What is the single most important piece of gear that you own? Probably a monitor, but I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm totally in love now with my Leica. So probably Leica R. What advice could you give a freelance cinematographer into landing bigger work? I'm looking for the answer as well, so I don't have one for right now, except for shoot, 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 shoot every day, every night, every week, shoot something cool and, and post it. Do yourself pitch out to clients and lend, and lend your gigs or does the work more so just come to you? Yeah, it's, it's literally guys like a, my personal connection and YouTube, maybe Instagram, it's just people finding me randomly and and people putting me in touch with the right people. So it's mainly networking, nothing else. Jonathan, does the Pocket 4K have enough dynamic range for client work? How would you compare it to other cameras? Pocket 4K has way more dynamic range than any Sony mirrorless camera and I'm pretty sure he has more than I'm hearing than an SA S1H camera. So uh, if you ask me, Pocket 4K is here, Pocket 4K 6K here, uh, everything else is just way down there. So if you ask me for client work, I would pick a Pocket 4K over any Panasonic or Sony mirrorless every day. You, you guys have to be um, careful with one thing, Sony, when they sell you their mirrorless camera, even on the A7S II, they were advertising that the camera had 14 stops of dynamic range. That is absolutely not true. That's a big lie. 14 stops of dynamic range on an A7 is not true and it's not real. Pocket 4K has a really good one and I think he has a real dynamic range of 12. Let's, let's put it this way, an Aria Alexa, has a real, real dynamic range of 14 stops. So if the Alexa has 14 stops, A7S, A7, those are all about 10, 10.5, maybe 11. Gianluca, how do you find Tampa are different? Tampa is different from LA uh, in terms of work opportunities in, in, in the filmmaking industry. The reality is that I was in the middle of creating a network and meeting people when this coronavirus thing happened. So. But no, the difference compared to LA is that everybody here is nicer. Uh, you go out with people, uh, you get a drink, you have dinner, uh, they introduce you to other filmmakers and you just meet a lot of people. I met way more people here in Tampa in one month than in LA one year. And in terms of work in uh, Tampa, Florida, um, it was going extremely well for me. I had three different gigs planned out in Miami. I had a possible retainer client that I was working on. 
and then this thing happened and, and, and everything kind of collapsed. Elizabeth, uh, does the full frame look make a substantial difference in the quality of your videos? I have the Pocket 4K and I'm wondering if it's worth the cost to buy a Metabon Speed Booster. Keep in mind that everything you saw shot on my Pocket 4K was shot with the Ultra Speed Booster for the Canon FD. I never really used the XL, which doesn't give you a full frame look kind of a full frame, probably 1.2 crop. No, I absolutely don't think so. Actually, I heard that the Ultra Metabones has a better image quality than the XL, which is technically the almost full frame one. I never really shot anything full frame in my entire life. So everything you see online, my website, my YouTube, my, it's all either Super 35 or a Micro Four Third. I still have to shoot full frame content. So um, no, I don't think they make any difference. I mean, it's a different look, but I mean, guys, cinema since hundreds years, it's super 35. Now they're getting into the large format and blah, blah, blah. But keep in mind that they shot super 35 for hundred years. So next question, Razvan, what's your advice about film school? As long as they don't break the bank, as long as you don't pay $60,000 a year, for a film school, I think they're worth it. Do they make you a filmmaker just because you went to film school? Absolutely not. Shama Shamaruku, good grading monitor. Also thoughts on emulating film grain. Film grain, there's a film convert that I think has the best film grain, I think. Uh, maybe we're gonna make some at some point when all this is over. But a uh, good grading monitor, dude, that's my question right now. Uh, I've been talking to my DAT friend of mine, Rafi. Uh, of course, the Flanders are the best, but I mean, I think they're ten thousand dollar used and twenty five thousand dollar new. So um, there's definitely a good option out there. MacBook and iMac have generally a really good uh, color reproduction, so they're good. Again, we're not talking about broadcast color grading monitor like Flanders or Sony or those Panasonic, those are on another level. But uh, I was asking again my friend and he's like, but I don't think it doesn't make too much sense if you're only doing online content because like for online, the best reference is probably the MacBook because most of the people are gonna watch this stuff on a Mac or an iPhone or an iPad. So Noku, how do we get white balance correct when shooting? I, I tell you my theory, that's what I always do and what a lot of pro that I know and they work on big commercial do. They look in the monitor and they move the white balance thing until they're happy. As long as you have a good Rec. 709 LAT, um, technical LAT that converts the log in a decent um, Rec. 709, I mean, and a good monitor that is like with pretty accurate colors, what I do, man, I just look into my monitor and if I like a little bit warmer, I move it up. And if I like a little bit colder, I move it down. I'm not that <clears throat> color chart, middle gray, white piece of paper, out of white bar. I, especially when you shoot raw, I don't think it makes any sense because it's only metadata. My workflow when shooting ProRes, so not raw, is the same. I, I check the monitor and I look like when I shoot Ari, I shot the feature film, I shot on Ari Alexa. I was looking at the monitor and uh, if I liked what I saw in the monitor, I was going for it. Keep in mind, even if you're shooting ProRes, you can still tweak a little bit the white balance. So it's not that like you're done uh, if you're not shooting raw. Of course, uh, if you're shooting ProRes and, and you're basically shooting 2000 Kelvin when you were supposed to shoot 6000 Kelvin, that's a problem. Uh, but as long as you're in that range and what you see is looking decent, I think you're good to go even when shooting ProRes. Three more questions. Christian, se ti chiede, um, oh, it's in Italian. Se ti chiedessero di insegnare in qualche scuola o corso di filmmaking, eccetera, so if they ask me to teach in some school or filmmaking class, uh, would you accept? Depends how busy I am. So if I'm busy, no. But if I'm not busy, I'm slow and I don't have anything to do, maybe if I can help or is something valid that I think is worth it, I'll definitely consider it. Um, 
especially now there's like coronavirus thing. I mean, what people are doing is just like doing classes online. I mean, right now, if someone want to learn something or you want to do one-on-one and that kind of stuff, hit me up because I have plenty of time and we can talk for hours and I can teach you whatever I, I can. Claudio Leone, what are your thoughts on the upcoming Canon EOS R5? I never heard about it and I have no clue what it is. I assume it's a new camera from Canon, but I'm gonna check it out. And uh, on the last question too was Canon EOS R5. And I, I, I have to be completely honest, I, I said this multiple times, I don't have any interest for Canon cameras. Uh, I don't like uh, the look. The color science they have, I don't like the dynamic range they have. I, I saw some video, I think, what is the last one? The super expensive one, 1D something, $6,000, 6,500 6, bucks camera. 10 stops dynamic range, I think. I mean, I, I was checking this video, the eyelids were super clipped. Um, I, I, I'm pretty confident to say that for the price, for 2,500 bucks, the Pocket 6K is the best deal out there. And I've been talking to people that put it side by side with another Alexa LF, and they were shocked. So my opinion, there's nothing comparable to the uh, Pocket 6K in terms of image quality, dynamic range, color science, codec on the market right now. Ursa Mini, Pocket 6K, I think to me they are the best cameras uh, out there. I saw some footage um, that I grade of the SH1, S1H. I checked some footage from the Fuji. I checked some footage from all the different cameras and I used a lot of them. I also tested out the A7 III and the Ursa and uh, the Fuji as well. I tried, I had the XH1 for a while. They're good cameras, don't get me wrong. But what Blackmagic gives you with that money is unreal. Take just the Ursa Mini. The Ursa Mini, it's a 4.6K up to 120P, 15 stops dynamic range, internal ND for $6,000. Why do you have to spend $6,500 for a DSLR? Uh, I just don't get it. So if we're talking about photos and video, I, that's another story. But if you're talking exclusively about videos, I don't think there's anything on the market right now like Blackmagic. That was it. That's it. Oh, 52 minutes. Wow. All right, guys. Uh, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you the next one.